Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, 0, 1. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Hello, team. Welcome to Comic Commentary, tie-in issues 22 and 23. In this series, we'll be reviewing the Young Justice tie-in comics that folded directly into the story arcs of the animated series. My name's Rich, and I'm here with my amazing co-host, Emily. Hi, everybody. In Comic Commentary, we will be discussing how the tie-in comics relate to the video game, the first two seasons of Young Justice, and the broader DC universe. But unlike our regular review episodes, we won't be having a Crashing the Mode segment, so consider this your spoiler warning. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on our website, crashingthemode.com, on the yjfiles.tumblr.com, and at our email address, whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. And with all that out of the way, let's hand it back to Emily for... Hello, Megan! Uh, this week we are talking about issues 22 and 23 in the final arc of the comics known as Players, and the individual issues being titled Landing on Boardwalk and Do Not Pass Go, respectively. Uh, the issue release dates were November 21st and December 19th of 2012, Uh, The timestamps in-universe are December 1st of Team Year Zero and Team Year Five, as we said last week, because time for some time skips going back and forth. Um, And the episode tie-in, again, is that the main plot takes place a month before the start of Season 2, while the flashback subplots take place between agendas and insecurity. The writer for this whole arc was Greg Weissman, penciler Christopher Jones, inker Christopher Jones, color Zach Atkinson, and letterer was not Desi Santee for the first time. It is Wes Abbott. Just in time for your next mission. The establishing shot for this issue is that back in Team Year Zero, Artemis and Bet Kane arrive at Wayne Manor for Dick Grayson's 14th birthday party. And in Team Year Five... Nightwing, Blue Beetle, and Wonder Girl travel together to Metropolis where they discover that all of the team and the League's efforts to break through the force field that surrounds the city have just failed. (laughs) It won't work. Uh, Then inside the city, Beast Boy and Bumblebee have moved Miss Harjafti to Bibbo's Diner, thinking that she'll be safer there. (laughs) It's the safest place in Metropolis. Right, because no one goes there. (laughs) Uh, we then cut over to Lex Luthor, who has just found out the alien force field cut straight through one of his underground labs and released Project Match from his containment pod. Match has got a problem in that scene. A little bit of little. He looks a little bit different. We'll get into that. Maybe, maybe a little. Maybe a little. Just a little. Is there, are we getting a little future future of Superboy glimpse? Maybe? No, no. Superboy's <laughs> oh, the stable oh, one. Oh, why am I mean? Uh, back on the moon, the captured members of the Justice League, plus Superboy, are trying to escape when they are brought before a first leader, Killstar. Killstar refers to the heroes as weapons and informs them that they'll be accompanying him on a journey as he takes off from the moon and heads out into space. Miss Martian and Lagoon Boy, who had been heading to the moon in the bioship, uh, now continue to pursue them, hoping they don't go like into hyperspace or jump to light speed or whatever. Because <laughs> that's whatever not a the thing. too fast to follow thing is. Right, exactly. It's like, let's just not hope for that. Let's just, yeah, let's do that. Then uh, down in Metropolis, Black Lightning and Jim Harper are sent to go investigate the origin of the force field. And Dick Grayson's birthday party continues in flashbacks. It's essential, guys. <laughs> we gotta, we gotta keep track of that. Uh, while Martian Manhunter. Uh, decides to confront the alien spaceship hovering above the city in Team Year 5. While he and the Flash attempt to talk with the attacker, another group of heroes attempts to sneak aboard the ship under the cover of a glamour charm from Zatanna. The next issue opens with tag team foosball games at Dick Grayson's 14th birthday party. Uh, Essential narrative. uh, Essentially, essential. This is key subplot. Uh, Then cuts over to McGann and Connor... As teenagers, remember, again, this is year zero, uh, on a covert (laughs) mission to protect President Harjofti, the elder, from Queen Bee's assassins. Clark Kent's also there, as in his reporter guys, to help with the mission as Superman and get to know Connor a little better. Unbeknownst to our heroes, Deadshot is poised on a nearby rooftop, ready to assassinate the president. 
And then in uh, Team Year 5, Batman gets an update on the Metropolis situation because we needed to have a recap <laughs> for anyone just jumping into the series. Uh, and reminds Robin that uh, that crisis doesn't need them right now and that the heroes have it all covered. Because then, of course, MASH bursts out of the ground in Metropolis and attacks Batgirl because nobody has anything covered. <laughs> Right. Ba- ba- Batman has too much confidence in these people right now. <laughs> uh, but back on the moon, I love that we say that this much with this arc. Meanwhile, back, back on, on the, the moon. Back on the moon. Our heroes attempt to reason. They're not on the moon anymore. I'm lying. Uh, they're just in a spaceship in space now. Oh, that's I true. I so guess they're past. They're past the moon. Yeah. Back past the moon. Our heroes attempt to reason with Killstar, and when. That fails, they get into a giant super-powered fist fight, as you do. Uh, and on Earth, Martian Manhunter and the Flash board the alien ship above Metropolis and confront the Collector of Worlds, but he outsmarts them at every turn and deflects all of their attacks. On the bio ship, Miss Martian and Lagoon Boy have a heart-to-heart about looking different from normal humans, and she even shows him what her true white Martian form looks like. This must have made you really sad, this scene. They almost kiss, but are interrupted by an alert from the bio ship telling them they are approaching Killstar's ship. On Killstar's ship, our heroes are still fighting Killstar and losing. And back down in Metropolis, Beast Boy and Bumblebee leave Miss Arjafti at Bibbo so that they can help with the alien situation. And we end back on the Collector's ship, i.e. Brainiac, where Nightwing and company have successfully snuck on board. At the same moment, Manhunter, Flash, and Adam are thrown out of the ship and falling toward the force field over Metropolis below. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> we just got to keep having these these dramatic endings. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> it's comics. That's how it works. <laughs> is it time to feel the aster? It is. Superboy, are you all right? I'm fine. Feeling the aster. I like the fact that at the beginning of this, we start off with finding out that Nightwing told Blue Beetle's parents that he's being a superhero. Yep, because it's I just such it. an it's such an interesting bit of world building, in the way that that's how the Young Justice universe works, and like we saw it with Artemis earlier in the comics, but part of that was like that she was part of the hero world, and like her family was villains, so there was some level of you could like chalk all of that up to like they needed to check in because of her history or something like that, mm-hmm. but this establishes really clearly that like no. If you're going to be on the team, you need your parent or guardian to sign a permission slip. <laughs> I like it. It's interesting. With Artemis's mom, there's also like, no, she she gets it. Yeah. Yeah. So you're like, okay, yeah, she's in. She's like, yeah, please do this. Please make it so that my daughter is, doesn't turn out to be a criminal. The <laughs> fact that she has these abilities is not a surprise. Could you imagine being like the non-powered parents of Jaime and they're like, oh, and also he's... Ultimate power, you know, like it's Hermione and her Muggle-born parents, right? It's, it's yeah. like the Harry Potter series. They're they're supportive. They don't get it, but they're supportive, right? Exactly. I just had this flashback, or like this, like oh, that and Blue Beetle's gonna have to erase their memories and all of his history of. No. <gasps> yeah, that was messed up. Rich, why do we keep? Why do you keep taking this dark places? <laughs> right, because I'm a writer. Let the children be happy for I cre- five minutes. Create beautiful people and then do terrible things to them and see what happens. That's what writers do. Oh, it's true. But uh, this whole arc, speaking of people feeling sad, uh, this this whole arc has McGann, uh, portrays McGann as being very concerned for everyone, but for Connor specifically, mm-hmm. even though they just broke up and it breaks my heart. It broke my heart when it first came out. It breaks my heart now that, it's clearly so fresh and the fact that they were together for five years and the fact that they write it that way that uh greg greg weissman bothered to write this as mcgann being genuinely concerned she is not in the mode of like god i hate my ex-boyfriend she's like he was my boyfriend a week ago and i still really care about him she didn't break up with him yep and (sighs) do you know what the time frame is like maybe when you were reading these you did not still know why I think I remember. I think I remember it being depths. We found out in depths, which premiered June 9th, and this issue came out 
November 21st. So same year. We all, so yeah. Okay. Same year, but later. All right. Yeah. So, so Comet came so out. So you did know. So we knew, and that makes it worse somehow. <laughs> that makes it worse on some level of like, you know why they broke up and you understand that they had to break up, but you still feel bad. I do. I feel emotions. I love these two. I just want them to be happy. I know, I know. But seriously. We've had the conversation 10 million times. I know it's complicated. <laughs> can I just can I just request an episode of season three that's everybody sitting in a circle and talking about their feelings? <laughs> I'd watch it. <laughs> just me. I mean, but <laughs> you're good. Yes. Because that's going to happen, probably. Please. Maybe maybe interspersed with a few combats, but other than that. <laughs> Every now and then just cut away to like some other character who's punching right. somebody, just keep people involved. But I'm just like, let everyone talk about their feelings. Superhero therapy session, please. Well, speaking of feelings, there's, uh, a, yeah. there's a shot in here of Zatanna. Of Zatanna. When Tornado uh, mentions that, just mentions Dr. Fate and how he's not around right now. He's off doing whatever. Nobody knows where he is. He's he's like missing. Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah, you're right. They do say he's missing. Greg, you know Greg's you know Greg has a storyline. Uh he, you can clearly tell that the whole creative team just wanted to go into this and wanted to do more mm -hmm. with her and do a story thread involving Dr. Fate. Mm -hmm. And I would have loved to see it and there are these seeds here and it doesn't get brought up in season 2. Even though I think in season 2 they reference the fact that Zatanna and Dr. Fate are working together at one point to deal with like the temple, the underground temple. I feel like mm -hmm. they may have both. He also protects the world from the war world. So like he's back by that point. And I just, I would have, I would have loved to see whatever they had planned for that. Cause I'm sure it would have been great. I think we commented on it uh, during that review episode. It's Dr. Fate, but we don't know if it's Zatara. Technically. True. True. I'm curious. But <laughs> I like to think it is. Me too. Because because if it's not, then that means worse stuff is happening. Right. But yeah, if somehow if we can find a way to tie that into season three, I would I would be very happy if this ever showed up again, or if the comics came back and we got to see the storyline. I would have loved it. But I also little things. I also love little things that we get in this comic that include. Uh, Nightwing's visual communications solution when they're like, we can't <laughs> talk to them. They, they can't hear us. He's like, just don't overthink it. Chill. <laughs> <laughs> he like, basically, it's like the technological equivalent of writing on a whiteboard and holding it up to a window. Right. And I love that in that scene, uh, Barbara still wishes him a happy birthday, even though the world is like falling down around them. <laughs> oh, she like wishes him a happy birthday and then blows the cake up. Like yeah, your she's birthday's like, wow, your birthday sucks. <laughs> your birthday is having a problem. Your birthday is having a problem. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's what this this arc should have been titled. Not players. Your birthday is having a problem, right. Dick Grayson. <laughs> and speaking of Dick Grayson's birthday, I love everything about the birthday party scenes that we get in Team Year Zero of like Barbara beating him at foosball and Alfred making pizza and then right. putting them in like pizza boxes to pretend that they're like store-bought pizza right because <laughs> alfred's just that extra don't be ridiculous and yes i made the pizzas i bought the boxes <laughs> yeah, that's right <laughs> and bruce refusing to miss his son's birthday that's a very cute moment. that is a that's very indicative of this yeah. This young justice Bruce that yes. I enjoy so much. Yeah. I love it's it. It's fantastic. It's just it's also humanizing and it's great. And it's a nice like relief of tension during this arc that is so heavily focused on like the world is ending three times over in Metropolis right now. Right. And then just every now and then we're like, by the way, when when Robin was 14, he had a birthday party. Isn't it fun? <laughs> uh, and I'm like, yes, yes, it is fun. Thank you for this. <laughs> Yes. I also really love in this issue, we get this flashback scene between Superman and Miss Martian, and it's fantastic. I love it so much. Yeah. Uh, where when he shows up at the um, 
what is at the speech that's going on, the hearings that are going on with the president in Karak. The impeachment uh, hearings for yes, yeah. Harjafti. Uh, yeah. And her and Connor are there, and he's just undercover as Clark Kent. She creates a telepathic link with him, like a private telepathic link, and recognizes him as Superman and calls him out on what he's doing. Like, Miss yeah. Miss Martian, little 16-year-old Miss Martian, who's always just, like, eager to please and wants everybody to like her, like, straight up is like, Superman, what are you doing? Yeah, it's like, I know who you are. I, I At first, I thought it was like, well, yeah, she's telepathic. Like, she, like, interacts with people not just through sight and hearing and that kind of thing. She also, like, it's got to at least even subconsciously, like, recognize people's brain patterns and minds yeah. around her. So that's what I thought it was. But the actual explanation is even more interesting and heartbreaking because she says... Uh, she tells him, I know his features better than I know my own. You can't hide the resemblance from me, and I don't like lying to my boyfriend. And there are so that's many... That's her things. reaction. But the thing that gets me is when she leads into that by saying Connor doesn't have mirrors in his room. Yeah. Oh, it That's the my thing heart. that gets me. That is a bit of fascinating character development. So he he doesn't he doesn't know his own face and see yeah. the resemblance. Now, there could be some argument made to be like, look, you know, he's replacing or killing Superman is his thing and it's, you know, it's being programmed in his head like he should know Superman's features and all that kind of stuff. I don't care. <laughs> this idea that Connor almost doesn't want to recognize what's happening you know like and doesn't oh the mirrors is just it's fantastic i love it it breaks my heart i love love it it i think it's fantastic breaks my heart yeah yeah because this line and this little interaction has so many layers because as i pointed out like i think it's fascinating also that she says i know his features better than i know my own not i know his features better than anyone else but i know his features better than my own like referencing the fact that like she puts herself together every day right she knows all of that and it's right. still just it's something that she's been doing for we don't know how yeah. long but it's not her whole life and yet this person that she interacts with so much she's like i know him better than i know what i look like because she is shifting so much yeah and the the end of season one superman comes to Cl- to connor and says yes you yes, know, like that. you did, a, gonna make that you did a great too. job. Yeah, you did a great job. Thanks for saving the Justice League. You know, I'm Clark Kent, you know, that kind of stuff. And it's understandable. It makes sense within the series. But it also is like, well, it's a it's kind of a bit of a hard turn for you, Superman, like up to this point, you know, like. But there's this thing that he says in the comics here, which is this idea that he wants to he wanted he wanted to come and be backup, but he wanted to interact with Connor in a way that Connor didn't have to pretend to be something. Yeah. He wanted to get to know him not as Superman so that Connor could just be himself, which I think is this great step forward that kind of scaffolds his character growth a little bit with this change at the end of season one. I love it. I think it's fantastic. And I think it's also an interesting tie in with that, that particular scene at the end of season one that, In that scene, when Superman approaches, before he even, like, makes it known that he's there, Miss Martian turns and walks away. Yeah. Like, she's just like, okay, bye. I'm going to peace out for a second. Yeah. And I think that this ties into that, that she, like, her and Superman have some level of understanding of, like, you need to treat this boy better. (laughs) Yeah. So when he shows up, he's like, I need to talk to him alone. Right. Yeah. Uh, I love it. So I like that. I like how all of this ties into each other. I love that scene. I feel ridiculous that I did not pick up on the next thing that you put in your notes. Like, I was clearly not paying enough attention. It took me a while because I remember I looked at that panel. And uh, I I looked at the panel after I read your notes. And I'm like, oh, God, so obvious. Why in the world did I not notice this? Uh, so that there's a quick scene that is basically after they have recapped all of the previous issue and it's framed as, uh, someone telling Batman, we cut over to Batman and Tim 
who have a brief conversation about like, we're the non-powered heroes. They don't need us right now. And it takes place in just this random apartment that I was like, what is this villain lair for a while? And then I realized it's Two Faces lair. Yeah, so clearly. Half of the room is like light lavender and white, and half of the room is black and red and covered in skeletons and torture machines. Yeah. But and it's not referenced in any way. Neither of them say anything about Two Face. It's just yep. there. Yep. And it's great and fantastic, and I love it. I think I'll have to look back at it again, but it also looks like he's got. We've talked about um, what episode was it? Oh, schooled. Uh, Bruce is in Wayne Manor in Metro, or not Wayne Manor in a Wayne Tech building in Metropolis as Superboy and Superman are having their interaction at the beginning, and he turns and he lifts uh, up this this uh, bust of William Shakespeare and pushes a red button, and his costume comes out. And that's a reference to the 1960s Batman show where they would lift this head of William Shakespeare and push the button and the poles would show up that they go into the Batcave. But on, it looks like Two-Face's desk looks like that exact same bust of William Shakespeare, but it's like burned, like half of it's burned and the other half isn't. And I'm like, wait, why would he, there can't be that many busts like that in the, why? There's there's only one statue in all (laughs) of Young Justice. Right. People just keep replicating it. It's a very popular William Shakespeare bust in Young Justice. Well, it is a it is a Greg Weissman property. <laughs> That's Shakespeare's fair. important. <laughs> okay, well, uh, tough but fair. That's a t- <laughs> tough, tough but fair observation. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Yeah. Moving on to that because that's one panel, and I think it's incredible that like they fit that in anyway. Yeah. Just ba- background Batman history. We also get something that stood out to me when reading it this time. I think it's just really interesting that when talking about the heroes that Killstar captures, he points out that Connor is like only half Kryptonian and he's referenced as being only half Kryptonian, but he's still lumped in with the superpowered people that have been deemed the most powerful on their planet. Mm -hmm. And I think that's fascinating, especially in comparison to like who was left behind and how this villain is like categorizing what power means. And it's just, it's just an interesting bit going on there with him. Yeah. And I know that narratively it's so that we can have a team member who's involved in the plot on the moon. Like narratively they had to pick somebody because somebody had to be there, but it's interesting that it's Connor. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. When he, when he considers himself so much less powerful than some of them. Well, also, if you reference back to the previous episode where we were talking about Wonder Girl. Yeah. Like being like, wait a minute, Superman and Superboy and Wonder Woman and... Not me? Not me? Yeah, right. Right. <laughs> Which uh, I don't know what that is. Like, is that a comment on the fact that Killstar just didn't know that Wonder Girl exists? Could be. Could be a I mean, comment she, on how she, just she doesn't have the as team. much training. She doesn't have as much training or control, so her power isn't as could be. powerful as it could be because she doesn't know what she's doing with it. Right, right. Yeah, and it could be just that she just joined the team and she may have no public yeah. record of any kind. Connor also has no public record of any kind as far as we know, but... As far as we know, but he does have things that... I mean, I don't know how Killstar knows what he knows, but assuming he's tapping into technology of some sort... Then I mean, there could be files at LexCorp or other things he could tap into. I don't know if Cassie's got a lot. We don't know. So it's just you know thought experiment. We don't know how they keep track of things on Themyscira. <laughs> right, exactly. Just scrolls. You can't hack a scroll. <laughs> can't hack a scroll. <laughs> Safer this way. <laughs> uh, total aside, uh, there somebody did this hilarious video. It was like, oh God, what was it? it? Was like after books were invented. So there was there's scrolls and then they invented books and then there was like tech support for books and like somebody like like I'm in a monastery like calling the tech support person over to to try and figure out how to like make this book work it was <laughs> hilarious but yeah can't hack can't hack a scroll can't hack a scroll uh, <laughs> uh, and finally last last point here is that. You you called me out on it of like, you must really not like this scene between Lagan and McGann. And I don't, I don't like it. I don't want it. I understand why it's there. But like emotionally, yeah. I'm just like, get this scene away from me. Out yeah. of my sight. Take it away. Yeah. But in the middle of a scene that I strongly dislike, 
McGann has a really important line that I love, where when she's talking to Lagan about being a white Martian, she says, this isn't who I am. It's just the body I was born with. And I think that it's so cool that like she's had five years to really like come to terms with her self image and think through all of the complex emotions she has connected to her white Martian identity and what she's chosen to look like and all of the things that revolve around that. And I think it's just such a wonderful encapsulation of all of that growth. Cause I don't think if you asked her in season one, she could have as nuanced of an answer as that. She may have felt that, but I don't think she would have been able to like fully verbalize that. Like, this is how I feel about what I am doing. Right. So I think that, She's she's more mature now. She's had five years to really come to terms with all of this. And I I love it because I have always argued that Miss Martian's choice of identity has never been just about like fitting in and looking pretty. Right. It's always been about her own personal comfort. And I love that they included that line in this of showing that like, yeah, that's how she views it, too. I agree. And I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I, I refer people back to our episode, our discussion episode with Sophia Soderstrand, where we were talking about like shape changing and identity and back to our um, Quinn Wilson episodes where we're talking about linguistics and psychology and him talking about the identity, the identity versus personality and the fluidity of them. And, you know, we, we do some deep dives into that. If you have some more interest in that, those are two of my favorite discussions um, as well. So you can revisit those. Also just adding on to all of this with the, that particular scene to anyone whoever wanted to think that like Lagan was not McGann's rebound guy. It's been like a week yeah. since she broke up with Connor. Like That's at the thing. Most. Wait, 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 wait. Who broke up with who? Oh, <laughs> who broke up with whom? Since, since Connor broke up with her. There we I go. Apologize. There we go. You know what I mean? Since uh, they I broke up. I recognize a Freudian slip when I hear it. You uh, like, since her and Connor ceased to be as a unit. Uh, uh, <laughs> technically also true, but does not put the onus of the action on where it belongs. I'm going to be clear on that. <laughs> yes, since Superboy broke things off, like going by context clues, it's never fully stated. Right. But I but think it does that seem to been, be not very long. <laughs> right. Like a week, maybe two weeks. Couple like it weeks. has not been enough time for her to process anything and she almost starts kissing Lagan on the bio ship yeah it's not it's it's weird it's weird it's a little weird yeah i agree with you just calling that out please talk about things you like i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> well i am and a bunch of different stuff this one i won't have as many many secret origins as the last one but maybe a couple uh that's, first that's of all for you. they have brainiac so brainiac is in this clearly it's brainiac I'm going to have to actually go through and, and check and see if they actually refer to him specifically as Brainiac. Do they? In the la- in the next two issues, when we get to those, somebody uh, refers to him as like, I think he calls himself a Brainiac or something. Oh, like yeah. Brainiac of Izod. Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a reference to what I'm going to talk about now, because Brainiac talks about like, I'm known by many names, right? Vril Dox is, Vril Dox is Brainiac's original name. The computer tyrant of Briac, that was a story arc at some point in time in the history of Brainiac where he was collecting all of these cities and then he was going to put them on another planet and rule over them as a conqueror. That wasn't really a thing as later on. Um, his homeworld is Kolu, but at some point in time it was also referred to as Yod. So he's the brain of Kolu, the maniac of Yod. So they're like making these references to all this stuff in the past and the collector of worlds. The one I couldn't find anything about was this not Lamenif. I don't know what that is. I have no clue. So I'm interested in, I don't know if it's an anagram or something. I don't know. I don't know where that came from, but I couldn't find anything. The only reference I could find to that was to references to this particular comic. So I'm not sure. Backwards, backwards, it's fine Milton. Maybe his name's Milton. Oh, that's what it was. It's Milton Fine. (laughs) Hey, wow, look at me actually being right about am I wait, did I You totally broke the code. (laughs) What are those what are those what what are those it's every detective show ever? You say, I don't know, backwards it's fine Milton. Emily, you're a genius. 
wait, what did I do? <laughs> You've cracked the case. I was I was genuinely joking. Anyone wow. listening, no. I was no. joking. No, Milton, no, no. Because at Share one, your knowledge, Rich. <laughs> at one point, this is why this is why we need the two of us to do the show. <laughs> at one point in time, Brainiac is his consciousness is transferred into a if I remember correctly, he was a sideshow psychic named Milton Fine, but then Brainiac realized that he had actual psychic powers as well. And so Brainiac was on Earth and he had the secret identity of Milton Fine and then developed these psych- psychic powers in addition to all of his other stuff. Because originally Brainiac was not a computer. He was an actual organic living organism, which was at a time also where they the Legion of Superheroes existed because one of the core members of the Legion is Brainiac 5, who's the fifth generation of Brainiacs, but he's an organic creature. And so there, you know, that's where... Brainiac originally had an organic body, but then he got into Milton Fine, and then they redefined him in like the 80s. Might, I might have been pre-crisis as to being some kind of robot technology thing. And anyway, it got crazy. But yeah, Milton Fine, thanks. Thanks for that. You're welcome. That's I don't, I'm here. I can't believe I didn't even see it. I even did it backwards too. I was Finemilnaton. I don't know what that is. That's why I'm here. Shipping in this. Fine Milton. Good job. <laughs> Milton Fine. All right. Well, now I don't have to ask Greg. Isn't that, <laughs> I can just ask Emily. Another thing I found really interesting was um, I know that in the show they make reference, like Aqualad makes reference a couple times to to McGann's physiology not being okay with heat. And I know that they make reference to that about physiology. But if you listen to my Miss Martian Secret Origin, we talk about like this weird heat thing that goes on with Martians and about how in the comics it's less physiologic and more psychosomatic and like a psychosomatic pyrophobia put into the Martians by the guardians who created the Green Lantern Corps because they didn't want Martians basically to take over the universe because they're the most powerful creatures ever. Well, here, I mean, Brainiac is is not someone who is basing it. Like if McGann told Calder, my physiology doesn't do well in heat, Calder would be like, oh, that makes sense. Now that's my frame of reference. Brainiac has none of that. Brainiac is just scanning her his body and saying like, oh, your physiology is vulnerable to heat. Okay, so now I'm like, okay, this is, a re, this is an emphasis on the fact that there's definitely a physiological thing going on with the heat. It's interesting or strange to me that at the end of season one, when McGann crawls into John's head and just like fills his existence with fire, it feels like more of a psychological reaction than it is just like, oh, I don't like heat. You it know what I mean? Both. It could be. It could be. Like that, I can read that scene as just her mentally incapacitating him with like, if you if you had telepathy, I say as if it's a, <laughs> as right. if it's a real thing that we right. have any frame of reference right. for. Right. And like, I could see like overwhelming someone with one of their greatest fears that is also connected to like, an actual physical need to not be in that situation. Right. Like, yeah. No, I hear you. That could work. I yeah. Think. It doesn't have to be one I or the think. other. It could be both. <laughs> That's possible. All of the above. When in doubt, all of the above. Right. What I, I love <laughs> Dick's like annoyed offhand remark about Barbara being good at everything. I love it too. She's good at, so she's much. good at everything. Everything. <laughs> But I also, with that, I like that it's a good setup for kind of giving her a basis for how she becomes Batgirl in a little yeah. bit of a way of showing that, like, Bar- like you can just be like, they're playing foosball, but also, like, she's got good reflexes. She's got good right. planning skills, whatever it is. She's good at things. Okay, right. that's enough to be Batgirl. Yeah, absolutely. I'll believe it. I wouldn't mind Barbara getting turned up a notch. Photographic reflexes, all of her in, like in intelligence and everything, that'd be really cool. Maybe she has them. We don't know. We don't know. Maybe. I know that in in some of the comics right now, she does have like an eidetic memory. Oh, that oh that tracks a hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, for and sure. And the I I recently read some Batgirl comics, and if I'm remembering correctly, she randomly at one point is like, "Yeah, of course I remember that Nightwing. I have an eidetic memory." Like, right, oh, so, right. No, sorry, forgot yeah. for a second. I remember everything. Uh, you mentioned Deadshot. Of course, Deadshot's got his uh, got his appearance in here too. Um, you can see a million things with Deadshot in it, um, including a, the movie I did not see and the movie that I did see, which was the animated version uh, of Suicide Squad, which is actually quite good. Um, just watch the ratings as usual. And then we get two, I think, pretty interesting bits. Though so Match, uh, Diana McCallum and I were just talking about Match 
And I had forgotten that he had shown up in this later issue as Bizarro, basically. So we talked about it a bit in the Diana McCollum episode. So you can go listen to that. But I was wondering at the time, like, oh, I wonder if Match is this match from the Young Justice original comics back in the day and from the Superboy comic from back in the day, or if it's supposed to be this Brainiac tie-in. Well, apparently it's both because once again, you mean Bizarro tie-in. Did I say Brainiac again? Yeah. Yeah. We got Bizarro. both. I know it's a lot of bu- 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 similar bu- names. Yeah. Both Superman related. Right. <laughs> So uh, clearly Match clearly Match has a genetic problem with his clone and he's becoming Bizarro. So we just like Greg Weissman never to have uh, a, a a a loose edge somewhere has tightened everything down <laughs> to Match and Bizarro. Yes, why not why have two when you can make them one story arc and make it awesome. And then we get a lot of Plastic Man <laughs> in this one. Yep. And he's like Plastic Man. He's just like the most ridiculous character. Yeah. And what's funny is, here's the thing that's funny. Here's the, here's the thing that's funny about Plastic Man. <laughs> All right, so Plastic Man was formerly a criminal. He got this crazy, mysterious chemical dumped all over him because comics. And then he had these, these stretching powers, right? So a little like Mr. Fantastic and, you know, all, all these characters, right? Like he can just stretch his body. But that's not all he can do. <laughs> while he was like being written in these early days of comics, they would make him do whatever they wanted to do. And unlike a character like the elongated man or Mr. Fantastic or whatever, who can just stretch their body and bounce and do that kind of stuff. Plastic man can turn himself into machinery that works. And you can see it in this issue where he's like a drill and he likes drilling yep. through the ground. And then he makes like a screen on himself and writes letters on it. And at first you're like, oh, well, he can change his shape. Well, the letters, what a big deal. But it's like, yeah, but every time he changes his shape, he never, ever changes his color. So if he turns into a chair, he turns into a chair with the bizarre color scheme of Plastic Man. So like, how is he writing these letters? Like, there's something going on and it's been hinted in the comics, like as they've brought him into the future, right? As he has evolved into the future, they have not changed or limited his powers in any way. Which leads people to look at him, like there have been comics where they're looking at him going like, that's not physics. Like, I don't, (laughs) that can't, are you altering reality? Is your power actually reality altering? At a, I mean, they talk about like he's immune to telepathy because his brain is literally not human anymore. Like his organs, nothing about him. He is in no way human with stretchy powers. He is just... (laughs) <laughs> He's just some bizarre, like weird quantum level break in reality. It is really strange watching him work because it makes my head spin every time he like turns himself into like a bulldozer or like a, a working rocket. And you're just like, what? Like, how does that? What? Like, and you're not going to see like elongated man and plastic man are like in similar episodes of like Justice League animated series. And Elongated Man just stretches. And you see Plastic Man do the standard, turns himself into a trampoline or whatever. But then he also like turns himself into crazy stuff. I don't know. Plastic Man is just bizarre to me. And he's just, I don't know. I just, I keep thinking of Captain Marvel just laughing. And like, I don't know. Plastic Man just cracks me up. <laughs> that guy's hilarious. And, and as a kid, you look at him and you're like, wow, that's, that's so funny. Because you're not like thinking about the consequences of what he's doing to reality around himself. Like, where Batman's got to be, like, going, uh, uh, what can't you do? What is the limit of your powers again? I can't turn into a microwave. I just can't do it. <laughs> Maybe. One thing. But I could turn into a nuclear bomb if you need. Like, I don't, you know, like, I don't know what his limit is. Can you turn into a working gun? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, in a in a in a comic book in an animated series in which we are we are seeing people do crazy physics bending things, Plastic Man takes it to a whole new level that makes my head spin. I, I swear, somebody at some point in time is going to figure out like, uh, you're like the most powerful being in the universe. You know, like I don't. You're only limited by the fact that you're not very bright. Like, I don't know. Oh, man. I don't know. Yeah, anyway. All right, we're ending that on a lighter-hearted <laughs> note than last time. 
Plastic Man cracks me up. Uh, and with and with that, with with that sort of secret origin. Also, you can also um, you can also like Plastic Man had an animated series when I was a kid. He was on the original Super Friends show. There was like a plastic baby. Like there, of course, because everybody had to have like a younger version of them. Um, and he was like a detective, former criminal, now a detective, I think, on the animated series from like the 70s. Um, he's been on Batman Brave and the Bold. He's just been, he's kind of been everywhere. He was just on episode of uh, Justice League um, Action, I think is whatever the new show is. Um, he's actually in an episode of that with Crypto and who was it? It was Crypto, Streaky, Plastic Man, and whatever the cat alien that's a Red Lantern is. Did you did you see that one? <laughs> No, but I no. love the cat Red Lantern right. so much. The cat Red Lantern comes to Earth and uh, Plastic Man is like adopted it, but he doesn't know. It thinks it's a regular cat and it gets into the Justice League headquarters. No, and then but Crip- Rich, the thing about the cat Red Lantern is if I'm remembering correctly, because I read its Wikipedia page one time, it's just a normal cat that became oh, it's a, a it's Red It's an Earth Lantern. cat. Yeah. It's an Earth cat who became right. Ra- okay, that makes <laughs> like, sense. It was just like... A, a earth cat that was treated poorly like after its owner just died or something like that. Right. And when the red ring came to earth, it was like, what's the most racist being on the planet? <laughs> and it was this one cat. <laughs> and it went, flew right past Guy Gardner. It went straight for this cat. Yup. If I'm remembering correctly. <laughs> comics are weird. Yeah. And I fun. love Well, them. there's a squirrel Green Lantern, so, you know, you gotta have the same. Anyway... <sighs> All right, well, and there we go. You can watch Plastic Man there and get that ridiculous storyline that also has Streaky and Crypto. I think it's Streaky's in it. Yeah, I think Streaky and Crypto are both in it. Streaky's a super cat, in case you didn't know. Anyway, let's get on to some artistic license. Have all four sidekicks ever been in the same place at the same time? Don't call us sidekicks. In Artistic License, we'll be recommending individual issues, miniseries, and graphic novel collections, both from DC and other companies who have titles that we think Young Justice fans will enjoy. Artistic License is designed to give you an on-ramp into the classic story arcs of the past so that you might catch a glimpse of what's to come in the future. Uh, in this Artistic License, I'm actually going to recommend uh, it's Captain Adam, Volume 1, Issue Number 46. And the reason why is because it's this six-issue story arc turned to 11. Superman, Captain Atom, Major Force, kidnapped by Killstar to uh, use them as weapons to, against a tyrant on his planet. Superman and Captain America, or Captain America. <laughs> Hello, wrong podcast. Superman wrong and Captain, series. <laughs> wrong series. Superman and Captain Atom uh, bow out and say, no, thank you. Major Force goes with Killstar and then, like, the comment about <laughs> taking over the universe first is in that comic. The thing about Killstar having a glass jaw, that line's in the comic. And, of course, it was written by Greg. So um, I think he took this one-issue comic and then just, like, expanded it out so that it was much more in-depth and interesting and that kind of stuff. But uh, the parallels Set are... it on Nightwing's birthday. <laughs> Put it on Nightwing's birthday. Right, exactly. Um, but we all have a link to that in the comic comicsology. Um, and of course, you can always pick it up at your friendly local uh, comic store as well, which we encourage. And with that, um, <laughs> I don't even know what to call that episode. A lot. Thank you, Plastic Man. Uh, I think we can wrap up this mission and head out of the Watchtower. I think people want us to do that pretty badly. <laughs> the best way to support the show is to share it with a friend. You can also support us with five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. Leaving a rating or review pushes us up in the search ranks and helps others find the show. Please continue to also hashtag buy YJ comics on comiXology to follow along with the storyline because it's a lot Uh, (laughs) and to buy the show somewhere online until that DC streaming service launches soon ish (laughs) quotation marks you can also now use hashtag young justice outsiders when talking about season three. And if you want to help us get more episodes, more secret origins, more actual play podcasts, and more of all of the other stuff that we do, please consider supporting us through Patreon. For just a few dollars a month, you can help us do even more with the show while getting some great rewards for yourself. And remember, stay whelmed, everybody. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. 
Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. Stay whelmed.